Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. The Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Johnny's Bite. It's the 11th of January, 2022, in the year of our Lord. So I trust you're fine. Well, I'm fine too. This morning, there's the two things that have engaged my mind all through the night, and I dare that we will have a quick conversation about it. The University Teachers Association are on strike. We are calling them back to the table. They had previously been on strike. We called them back to the table, begged them and told them to go back to the classrooms. But since they went back to the classrooms, did we do what we promised to do for them? We did not. When people strike and you beg them to go back to the classroom because the academic calendar is suffering and you ask that they, will, they have to make such certain considerations for you, and they make those considerations and then only for you to go back on your words. That's not fair. And you see now, they are on strike. Everybody seems to be focusing on them and saying that, oh, eh, the children have traveled long distances. The children have come to school. Their parents, da, 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 and da, 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 da. But we are not sorting the teachers out. The university lecturers. Who teaches the politicians? Who teaches the doctors? Who teaches the nurses? Who taught the journalists? Who taught the finance minister? Who taught the Greek minister? Who taught all of them? They are university lecturers. Now, the university lecturers are saying that, look, we are looking at our conditions of service. We are looking at our book and research allowance. We are looking at how much you are giving us to be able to educate the nation. For every nation to rise, you need education and the best of it. And they're saying that what you are giving us is woefully inadequate. Now they have served notice. NLC says, go back to the classroom, come back to the negotiation table. They say, we will not. We will come to the negotiation table, but we will, we will still put that, lay down our tools because we have done it a couple of times and you didn't engender our trust. Now schools are supposed to reopen. Soon as are stranded, agreed. The academic calendar will be affected, agreed. But those university lecturers, they also have families. They also pay school fees. This week and next week will be school fees week. If you know, you know. If you don't know, you don't know. You pay school fees. If, you're, if your child is at a lower level, you buy toiletries and add on to it. Feeding fee, transportation, all of those come to play. The lecturers also have families. They have children. When you advise the cat, you also advise the fish. When you advise the cat, you also advise the fish. So that there's harmony. Pay the university teachers their monies. Treat them well. And they have, the, you see, the point is that they have, uh, what do you call it, colleagues in other countries. They go and do sabbatical. They see how much their colleagues are earning elsewhere. A university lecturer, a doctor will teach someone, and before you know it, the person has a PhD. The next day, the person is in government, and the person is earning four, five, six, seven, eight times more than what they are earning. You think they will be happy? They will not be happy. They will not be happy at all. So this morning is a very, very simple appeal. Mr. Government, good morning to you. National Labor Commission, good morning to you. Fair wages, good morning to you. Get the teachers back to the table and give them their monies. Look after them well, and they will look after your educational system well. It, I say it doesn't add up if you, you change curriculum, you want to improve, you want to digitize, you want to do all those things. And yet the people who will be the main change agents to make sure that whatever you have envisioned comes to play are not well taken care of. That is not good. It doesn't look good. So please pay the teachers. Oliver, play the video of His Royal Majesty Otufu said to for me. Yesterday, there was a, a media capacity enhancement program. It will start one week for 250 journalists. Fantastic idea. 
Kojopo Nkrumah, congratulations to you and your team, Fatih Abubakar and the rest of the team at the Information Ministry. Fantastic idea. It's taking so long to come, but it's here finally. So congratulations to you. And congratulations for making sure that you're putting journalists first. And congratulations for also ensuring that there's capacity that will be enhanced. But beyond capacity enhancement, what else? Beyond capacity enhancement, what else? We'll ask that question. Play that video of His Royal Majesty O2482 for me. We have just come through a year in which our constitutional order was put through its severe stress. The commencement of work on the 8th Parliament of the 4th Republic had not been in the most edifying tradition. But no one could have expected that the year would conclude with an honorable house degenerated into a brawl with very honorable members putting aside their debating skills in order to exhibit their punching prowess. Zero. The stress on our highest institutions of state on the nation's side have shown clearly that we cannot afford to be complacent or take anything for granted both now and the future. Constant introspection is necessary if we are to avoid the unexpected and secure the future for generations to come. When it comes to matters relating to what is referred to as the fourth estate, we tend to treat it with less than the seriousness it, it deserves. After all, we do not elect them, nor do we have to worry about how much our taxes they need for their upkeep. Nonetheless, the role the media plays is as critical as any of the institutions within the body politic. Zero. Every professional journalist knows that his greatest asset, indeed the greatest asset of the profession, is credibility. Where the momentum of politics may be leading, the peace and stability of our nation must be inviolable. Zero. The media will be doing a great service to the nation and indeed to our humanity if they can create an environment which encourages consensus building to help lower the causes of tension within the body politic. Thank you very much, Your Royal Majesty, and thank you to the Information Ministry as well. We are enhancing capacity. That's good. That we enhance capacity. But of what impact will capacity enhancement be if we have not properly looked at the ownership of media in this country? Ownership of media in this country. We are enhancing capacity, but the ownership of media. Because if I have capacity, my capacity is enhanced to the most optimal level. And the ownership of the media house that I work with will cave into political pressure. The ownership of the media house that I'm working for is only interested in making profit. The ownership of the media house that I'm working for only has political coloration. Of what impact would capacity enhancement be to me? That's the first one I want us to know. And you see, ownership of media in this country, check the NCA law, check all those ones. It says that the media house holds or the press holds the, the, the spectrum in trust for the people. It belongs, to the, it belongs to you, the people. The only thing the media houses own are the cameras and the lights and the microphones and all those other things. But the network is for you. So yes, capacity will be enhanced. But of what impact will that capacity have if the media ownership is not looked at? Check the ownership of media these days. And you're wondering why journalists cannot speak up. Check the ownership of media. Politicians are taking over. Politicians are taking over. Some have more than three, four, five, six media houses. They're taking over. So when they wake up, they have a certain political agenda that they are feeding into the minds of the people. You will enhance capacity. That is a good thing. 250 journalists, I salute you. But have we also looked at it? Because it is not just capacity enhancement and to create the impression that, oh, our people don't have capacity and that is why they cannot do. If I have capacity and then the ownership of the media house that I work with is caving into political pressure, the ownership of the media house that I work with has become an appendage of a political party, how do you expect that the capacity will play out? How will the capacity play out? 
The second thing is about remuneration. Pay. I know that most journalists will not say it. Me, I'll say it. Can you? How much are journalists paid in this country? Considering the high risk job that they do. The president in 2019 was with us at a beautiful dinner telling us about press freedom. We have since dropped so many times on the press, uh, uh, press freedom index. We have dropped. On the 3rd of May, we were, we were there. We were all uh, eating fine dinner with the president. He was telling us about press freedom and all of that, that he would rather like uh, a noisy media as opposed to a timid and praise singing media and all of that. Oliver, pull up that, um, the, the quote from the president from 2019. He was telling us the World Press Freedom Day was celebrated here at Kampinski Gold Coast Hotel. I was there. Just when the president was telling us that a few hours later, a journalist was being beaten at the MPP headquarters. The party didn't say anything about it. The government said nothing about it until journalists threatened that they were going to boycott NPP activities. And then the party spoke about it. We saw the same on the NBC. But you see, journalists are not well paid in this country. And that is why they continue to be tied to the apron strings of people. And that's why some people believe that, oh, every journalist is supposed to be corrupt. You will enhance capacity. But if you don't pay the people well, that's a problem. You will enhance capacity. But if you don't pay the people well, there will be a problem. And that problem will, will stem from the fact that you cannot bite the hand that feeds you. If you go to the GIJ or to Lagos, wherever it is, and you get a degree, and you decide to join, say, the police, and you start with the officer corps, you're starting from the ASP. In four or five years, if you have good behavior, you have done your work very well, you get recommendation, you take your courses, you move to DSP, and, and on and on like that. You start at uh, lieutenant and you move on to captain, that kind, kind of thing. What is the promotion rate for journalists in this country? And how much is the average journalist paid in this country? Let's call it speed a speed. How much are, are journalists paid in this country? Remuneration. How much are they paid? Looking at the high risk job that they do. Then it comes to the next point. Who gets hired? Yesterday, the information minister mentioned that majority of the people working in media are not trade. Correct, but read chapter 12 of the Constitution. Freedom of speech, all of those ones is there. So journalism is not like architecture or law or uh, accounting or whatever it is, or engineering, where you need a certain licensure to be able to practice. These days, all of you on Facebook and social media, tweeting and texting, and this morning you are sharing, you are practicing some form of journalism, if you like, blogging, whatever it is you want to call it. But who gets hired? I told you earlier about media ownership, right? So you enhance capacity, but if the media ownership belongs to a politician, forget about it. There are stories that will never see the light of day. There are things that will never be discussed. Because the station belongs to a politician. And if your politician who owns that station has a certain godfather who also breathes down his neck, some stories will never make it onto your network. So you can enhance capacity all we can. But the reality is that the politicians, those among your folks who own radio stations and TV stations, we know what you do. You know the, we know the calls you make. Now who gets hired? You go to a funeral. There's a funeral MC. He has a good voice. He has a fine face. I see Brabe Ejumamami. That's all. You go to a funeral, you go to a party, somebody speaks very well, fluent, lucid, a can, or whatever it is, like, come and work for me. Then there's the argument of intimidation and threat. Hold on with that thought. This is the president in 2019. He says, I will say again that I much prefer the noisy, boisterous, sometimes surreal uh, media of today to the monotonous, praise-singing, sycophantic one of yesteryear. President Kufado told those assembled for the Press Freedom Awards dinner. It was at the Kempinski Gold Coast Hotel. Today, we are being asked to sing praises. When you ask questions, they say, why are you not saying anything nice about the government? The president himself he said he will prefer all of this than the praise singing sycophantic one. They want us, to, see, the president gave us a charge. Today, they want us to change from the charge that the president gave us. Sometimes when politicians talk, I think they, they, they talk and they forget it. So there's intimidation and threat. Pull Ahmed Suarez's photo for me. I've told you that there are things that journalists will not talk about in this country. And since I started Johnny's Bite, if I tell you the number of admonitions, people, they, 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 be careful, blah, blah, blah. I said, so why, why should I be careful if what I'm saying is not a lie? If you are not countering what I'm saying with counter facts, why should I be too careful? Why? 
This is Ahmed Swali. What was his crime? His crime was to expose corruption. Corruption that went all the way to FIFA, to CAF, GFA, everywhere else. He exposed corruption. What happened? His photo was shown like this on television. We all know the story. The police is yet to close the docket on this matter. He remains dead. Now, if anybody at the GIJ or AUCC or whichever institution that trains journalists is interested in investigating journalism like Anas Aremeya and Tiger IPR and this guy, gentleman, bless his soul, Ahmed Swali, whose blood is still on some people's hands. If they have the intention of becoming, put his picture up there, becoming, uh, what do you call it, an investigative journalist, you think that they will not be afraid? That's where the intimidation and the threat start from. The calls sometimes journalists get for trying to publish a certain story, the calls, the text messages, the insults on social media, the attacks, the vituperations, all of those ones. So we can enhance capacity, but let's address the intimidation and threat. Now, there's also a struggling business module. Those who have decided that we are going to do journalism, whether print, online, radio, TV, whatever it is, there's a struggling business model, the financial and logistical constraints that they have. I'll give you a classic example. When COVID-19 started, Media General here, we took it upon ourselves to record, uh, what do you call it, advocacy and campaign messages to tell people, wash your hands, do they? We want to bring about eight doctors or so to come and record that. I recorded with Bella, all of us, Anita, we recorded, we recorded as we're playing there. We even did some uh, graphics as well in 3D and all of that. And we're playing all those ones for free on our airtime. Of course, it is our responsibility as media also to support. But I'm saying that since we started this MBSSI loan and we said we're giving them, now we have changed it to Ghana, uh, Ghana uh, uh, Enterprise Agency or whatever it is. And we decided that we're giving out support to industries. Are we giving support to the media? But we are the first to say, be the one to trumpet what government is doing. The media doesn't buy electricity. Doesn't the media buy light? Don't we buy water? Don't we hire people? Don't we buy fuel? Don't we buy cars? Don't we pay people? Doesn't the media eat? So yes, you want the media to play the role of the fourth estate of the realm, but also remember that the media is also business for some people. And that is where the fine line must be struck. It is also business for some people. There's a struggling business model. And I've told you that it depends on who owns the media house. Certain stories will not make it. And there are stories that are published that are pulled down. And you, we know those people who make those calls. So when you say we should enhance capacity, we agree. I salute you for that. 250 journalists. But enhancing capacity alone is not enough. After capacity enhancement, what next? I've given you six issues now. Now, there's also the covert influence. A covert influence. Calls are made. Messages are sent. Meetings are arranged, then trust is undermined. Because if you can't leave me to do, you want me to leave you to do your job, to govern. But you don't want me to, you don't want to leave me to do my job. You want me to leave you, you to do your job as a state agency. But you don't want me to, you don't want to leave me to do my job. You are undermining my trust. And I've told you that my responsibility and my allegiance is not to you. My allegiance is to the people of Ghana, to the voiceless. Today, a lot, more, a lot of my media colleagues are quiet because I've told you earlier, if your salary is not good and somebody is contributing to your rent, somebody is paying your school fees, somebody is taking care of your children for you, and the person is a politician or somebody, somebody in an influential position, would you go and buy the hand that feeds you? No. So yes, we'll enhance capacity, but after capacity enhancement, are we going to talk to media houses to pay their people well? Are we going to support them uh, with the financial and, and business constraints? Are we going to look at those ones? That's what I'm looking at. Can the media be considered as one of the freest, even though Ghanaian journalists are unable to tell the whole truth in most cases? What is the way out? Not all journalists in this country are corrupt. Let that sink in. I said not all journalists in this country are corrupt. And not all media houses have been captured as being corrupt. The likes of the Kweku Bakos who didn't go to mainline journalism school, but practice on the job and have become an example for many to look at. We can also start with these 250 that we want to enhance in terms of capacity. 
but there are journalists and entire newsrooms that continue to push and expose corruption and rot in high places. Those ones, there's covert influence. A freelance journalist was shining the light on human rights and good governance. My good friend Manasseh from GIJ. Some of these ignored by the mainstream media have created podcasts. So you find that that state-owned media, that's not firing. Become more like a PR agency for government. That is not what we are looking for. Check the CDD report. Check the Media Foundation for Africa's findings. Check out the collaborations and check out the reports that have come through. Transparency, accountability issues. All of those ones are central. Pay the people well. Train them well. Let the politicians take their hands off media ownership. And, and make sure that the journalist is indeed free. We cannot just fix the systemic problem that impede media freedom. Because there's no one simple solution to the problems that the, it plagues the Ghanaian media. And for me, my hope is that the research and the reports, what has been done all over the world, it points to one thing, that if the press is free and not reckless, because you can, you can actually repeal the criminal libel law, but then the, the motives and the moves that are done at, at the back could be even more worse if you had left the criminal libel law to be there. If you want the press to be strong, enhance capacity, give the press the free hand to operate. And if you are giving the press feedback, don't attack the press. Don't insult the press. I hope this sinks in. I hope this really, really sinks in. I hope it sinks in so that we don't come blowing the trumpet out of proportion that we are enhancing capacity for 250 journalists. I say beyond capacity, what else is there? I've given you the roadmap. Pay them well. Have a career route for them. Media ownership. Stop the calls and text messages. Stop the intimidation and the threats. Leave the people to do their work. Bismillah, Rabil Alamin. Good morning.